The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. I'll have to tell you, I looked at uh, the lifestyle of the world. Entertainment has become disgusting. You can't even watch television in my case because it's, uh, it's like watching a movie about Sodom and Gomorrah. Every five minutes, they're shoving things down your throat. These brand new lifestyles they've introduced, they are warping the minds of young children. Everything is happening. And it's almost like people are self-destructing and they can't see it. Well, according to the Word of God, they're not going to see it until it's too late. And it's designed that way, and it's very difficult to know. If you carefully examine the words in the Bible, you find out that the Lord said He would send them a strong delusion, that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here's the key. What is unrighteousness? Well, in order to know that, you have to see what God calls righteousness, what he sees as decent. He already set and established a way for us forward. Things of the world are highly grotesque. They are twisted, they are. I have no judgment toward the people because they don't know what they're doing. God will judge them when the time comes. I do understand and I'm very patient and compassionate and mindful that if a person grows up in this world, how can they see this world for what it truly is unless they too are in the bosom of Christ in fact we did not see it until we were in the bosom of Christ it's impossible to see the iniquitous state of this world unless you're in the bosom of Christ you must have something to compare it to if you're in darkness if you were born in darkness and there was no light how could you ever say this is very dark you couldn't because if it's all you know it's home. So to people who live in the world, it's home. You guys have that advantage, being called and coming to the Lord. You can compare and say, wait a minute, I remember when I was in the world and it seemed different. And you know that when you came to Christ, and as you read the Bible, and as you believed, that's when things were different. That's when things really changed. Because you found out the contrast of God's goodness. It affirmed those things within you. And when you looked at the world, you said, nope, that this place is dark. But you can't tell a person who's never seen the light to come out of the darkness. They must see the light first. Again, if you're born in the dead of night, why would you ever call it night? You would call it normal. If you were born and lived always at nighttime and knew nothing about the daytime, you would never have anything to compare the nighttime with. And so guess what? It wouldn't be dark to you. It wouldn't be strange. It wouldn't be ugly. It would be home. But when you see the light, that's when you discover just how dark things are. That's how you see it. And one of the biggest mysteries a lot of people talk about being lights, one of the biggest mysteries is this. When people see you and when they see your activities, when you're bound in Christ, that's when they see the light. That's when they start to compare and reflect. And they say, wait a minute, I'm in darkness. I don't want to be here. I want to be there where that person is. They've got something in them I desire. That's what I'm looking for. And then they start to, the Lord opens doors and they start to hear what you have to say. But I give you one caution. Not that I'm anybody to caution anybody, but I give you one caution. When you speak to somebody else, have this in mind. Whatever you do for that person, do for them, not for yourself. Never cultivate a person to be good for yourselves. Don't do that. Always depart things good to a person for their sakes so they can have a solid relationship with Christ. In other words, if you don't care for a person, you have no business with that person. You can't speak to that person because you're not speaking in love. You don't have their best interest in mind. Never do it for yourself. Don't talk to other folks to make them better so that you can have an easier day. Don't do that. When you talk to somebody else, including, I'll tell you something, it works for your kids too. I'm not your grandpa or anything. I'm not telling you how to raise your kids, but when you speak to your kids, understand that they have to survive. If the Lord allows them to live in this world for any length of time, they have to survive. So do whatever you're doing for their sakes, not for your sakes. In my life, I've come to the conclusion a long time ago that those things 
I aspired to be and wanted to be and all these things, I put all that behind me. It's gone. I've devoted my life for the sakes of other folks. And that brings me a lot of joy. When people actually, when they get through obstacles, when they start to see, when they put darkness down in their own lives, when they're empowered, they are empowered. Teach them how to walk. Teach them how to stand. You can be that example, that early example, and the Lord will raise them. But we can certainly sow seeds. We can water those seeds. Remember, it is God that gives the increase. And what the increase is, is you can have a seed planted in the dirt. It may not do anything. You can water that seed. Somebody else can water that seed. It may not do anything. God determines when it takes root and when it grows. We don't determine that. We never determine that. God does. A lot of people get frustrated because they'll say, well, you know, I talk to this person every day and they're not getting it. Well, that's not up to us. We sow seeds. We water seeds. It is God that gives the increase. That's an actual scripture. That's what Jesus taught. These are biblical principles and kingdom principles. Whenever God decides, that's when it clicks in their mind, right? It will not click until God gives that increase. And when he does, the water begins to work. The soils work. Germination begins. The plant grows. It takes off. God determines that. So leave that to Him. That's why when you're talking to somebody about the Word of God, you're not there to convince them. That's not what you're there for. You're not there to make them believe anything. Never try and make somebody believe something. That is the as an action of force. And all that does is breed. Look at the fruit of your conversation. If you walk away frustrated, you're mad, angry, disappointed. Those are not good fruits. Good fruits are when you walk away and you have to part. You have given to somebody all of what the Lord has given to you to give to that person. And you walk away with an upright heart saying, thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. You don't know when the person is going to actually take all that in and grow with it, right? They hear everything you say. They also see everything. You guys heard everything your parents said, even when you said you didn't hear them, even when you were not paying attention. Because later on in life, some of the sayings that your parents had, you finally saw. And when you saw them, you said, ah, oh, that's what they were talking about. They told me this would happen. I can't believe it. It actually happened. And they told me this. I didn't believe them back then. Now I understand. We do things like that, don't we? We find out later on that we heard everything. Truth be told, anything you see or hear is in your mind. Do you know that? It's in there somewhere. Did you know that God recalls things in your mind for the sake of your growth? He is the one that causes you to remember specific things. And all of that is part of his communication with you. It's an amazing thing. It really is. Folks, let me give you a hint of something of your future. Do you not know that the Lord said the saints will possess the kingdoms of this world? See, a lot of people have their minds on leaving, and they're forgetting about the thousand-year reign. Paul specifically said in Thessalonians he was talking about that change. When you do change, yes, you'll forever be with the Lord, but it never said you're going to forever be in heaven. That's not what it said. You'll be with the Lord. But we know that the Lord's going to be right here on this earth. And the thousand-year reign starts before what? The judgment. And if the judgment is the time of times and the thousand year reign must come and it's only 12 segments to time itself you may not know this but you're right at the door of the thousand year reign book of daniel hopefully you guys understand this tonight we got to get this premise in there because this will this will knock you out there's never been a time when i could perceive what i'm perceiving now it's an amazing thing it's also a very terrible thing because the realization of the Lord's coming is not spoken about. It's not really taken serious. If people were serious about the timing of the Lord, His coming, His returning, the whole world would not be doing what it's doing right now. The cruelest person on this earth would change his ways in a heartbeat. Satan would give up his cause. Do you know that? So it's, it's very difficult for a person to perceive what's happening. But I'll tell you what, I didn't ask for it. It's just coming anyway, which means possibly some of you asked for it. And again, the Lord will use a mule, won't he? He'll do it every time. I'm going to read something to you guys. Daniel 11, 31, 32 and 33, 34 and 35 are very important. 31 starts like this. And arms 
shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Now, when a group, this is when it says, and arms shall stand on his part, that means armies, soldiers, are going to be under his command. They're going to go into Jerusalem, not just one person, not just one country, multiple countries are going to go into Jerusalem, multiple countries, all who have indignation against the Holy Covenant, right? All of their forces are going to go into Jerusalem. Now listen, they're going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. The very presence pollutes the sanctuary of strength and the sanctuary of strength. We know what that is. That was described by the prophets in the Old Testament, by Ezekiel, Isaiah, by Jeremiah, God's holy mountain, Zion. All these words are utilized to imply a very strong place, like the heart of a place that will never go away, the hope of a place, the heart and hope of a place. They're going to pollute it. They pollute it by their very presence, which means they shake the hope of Zion. That's the first thing. That's just by entry. So they enter in. Nothing has happened yet. They just enter in and they start to fight. They start to take over things. But then it says, after they pollute the sanctuary of strength, they take away the daily sacrifice. This is before they place the abomination and desolation there. They take away the holy sacrifice. What is that? What is the holy sacrifice? Now, this is God talking here. This is not man's perspective. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say this. A holy sacrifice can never be an animal because Gabriel is calling this a holy sacrifice, not Daniel. Come on, stay with me now. God will not see a sacrifice of any animal as holy. He already said that. He already told his people that they would reject the Messiah and that he would not accept their offerings. He wouldn't do that. So what would be a holy sacrifice is a sacrifice in line with God's word. The Messiah has come. And so the only holy sacrifice they would have would have to be holy in the eyes of God. Because this is Gabriel talking. Man cannot deem something holy. And then God say, okay, because they deemed it holy, now it's holy. No, nope, doesn't work that way because they're rejecting the Messiah. But they pray. Do you hear me? They pray all the time, don't they? They pray. They sincerely pray. There are some who sincerely pray. Not all, but they sincerely pray. In fact, they come from all over the world to pray. That's a holy sacrifice. Remember, this is not man's perspective. See, if it were, when man has a perspective, man says, okay, back in the Old Testament, you sacrificed an animal that was holy. Yes, but we're talking about an angel is calling it a holy sacrifice. Not man. The Messiah has come. Any sacrifice is going to be an abomination, just like God said it would be. So he's not looking upon that as holy. In fact, it cannot be holy because a Messiah has already come. It cannot be holy. So a true holy sacrifice is just what God said it is. You ever heard, hear that term, a sacrifice of praise? You guys ever hear that? Sacrifice of praise. It's a Hebrew phrase that covers that. He takes away the daily sacrifice. And this word is in italics. Do you guys ever see that? So there's something else to this word. I looked at the original meaning of this word. At first, it didn't make sense. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. It didn't make sense when I looked at it. But anyway, let me let me get beyond this point because we're going to go back piece by piece over all this. But he takes away the daily sacrifice and then he places the abomination that make it desolate. So this is a process. He comes in maybe a couple of days later, three days later, four days later after the fighting because it's not going to happen with a snap of a finger. This is going to be a systematic change. So he sets up the abomination of desolation. And the Lord had already told them, when you see this, go and flee. Those who live in Judea flee into the mountains. He's telling them to run. Get out of that place. Flee it. Can you imagine that? God is telling his people to run. Why? Why would he tell them to run? And Matthew doesn't say when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then those in Judea, you better flee to the mountains. Don't go back to take anything out of your house. Pray that your flight is not in winter. Woe to them that are with child give suck in those days. Pray, uh, uh, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. So he's saying, get out of that place. Why? Because 
These will be the times of his indignation that he will not turn away. In other words, he has already decreed that this, verse 31, is going to be his indignation, the fulfillment of his indignation, the fulfillment. And his indignation is this. He said he would not turn back from it. He would not repent. But they would lose Jerusalem, that he would bring an army into Jerusalem and to utterly make it waste. That was his declaration. That was his indignation. And he said, once they do this, and his indignation is satisfied, and they are purified, he's going to look back down. And everybody who set in their hearts to go against Jerusalem is going to pay for it big time. See that? See, we got to line this up. That will absolutely 100% take place. The only difference is this, because it's also in Revelation, and Jesus said it too. He spoke about the same thing. He gave a caution about that. He told them that this would be. In fact, the Bible explains that during this time, people will see this and be astonished. But that's when the real scoffers come and say, they're going to say, where's the promise of us coming? When they're in trouble like this, they're going to say, well, where's he at now? I thought he, I thought you guys, you know, that your God was real. Where's he at? He didn't save you from us. They're going to scoff. They're going to mock. Other people will be uh, discussing some sort of political solution to get these guys out. And it kind of lets you know that the rest of the world is still, you know, doing its thing. If the world altered before this event a lot, why would it ever say that it says this in 33, and they that under, well, not 33, it says that um, 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. When you cleave to somebody with flatteries, it's when you tell somebody exactly what they want to hear. For example, suppose this happens in Jerusalem. And somebody gets on the news and they say, you know, America is talking with the UN and several councils and NATO. And we're doing everything we possibly can to resolve this politically. We've already condemned the actions. You guys already know what's going to come. It's kind of like Putin going into the Ukraine. We condemn it. And that's it. That's all you get. So they're going to tell them everything they want to hear. Or we're going to do everything we can by international law to get these guys out of your land. We already know that will happen. Even in Israel, they know it's going to happen. See, in Israel, let me tell you what they believe in Israel, what the, what the rabbi rabbis believe in Israel. They know this indignation is coming. They know exactly what the indignation is. They know God's declarations about the indignation. They know about the abomination of desolation. They know that for three and a half years, it's going to be trampled underfoot. They already know this. They know it's coming. They know that no one can escape it. They know that some of them are appointed to guide people out, but they're going to lose their lives. They know about the purging. It's, it's us over here that don't know about it. We kind of deny it. But those in Israel who keep the original writings, they know about it. They do not deny it. They know what's coming. They even know where it's coming from. In fact, they have a lot of intel on this. They know they can't stop it. They already know this, but they must tarry. They must continue until the Lord decides when that time is. They already know about the decrees and declarations. It's the, it's the clever folks over here that do not, they get everything mixed up. Why? Because we, we live in very, uh, a very cushioned life. We don't see the truth of the matter. Because they're trying to interpret something by the way we're living over here. We don't live with the same atmosphere that's over there. And when it happens, they already know that everybody's going to see it. They already know that they're going to have these political conversations and people will cleave to them with flatteries. They already know this stuff. When this happens, during this three and a half years that they occupy Jerusalem, right? That's when this evil person comes on the scene. Now, this is before the earth is totally undone. You know that, right? This is before the earth is totally undone. That's verified in the book of Daniel. As you continue to read, it's verified because after all this, you read chapter 12. And chapter 12 says, and at that time, at the beginning, this is Daniel 12, 1. It says, and at that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never once since there was a nation, even to that same time. So we know that the real shaky times begin in chapter 12. So what does that tell you? That means during the setup of the abomination of desolation, during this setup, it's going to be just like it is right now today. Uh-oh. Now what 
did Paul say about the day of the Lord? He said, that day shall not come. It shall come a falling way first, that man of perdition be revealed. This is the man of perdition being revealed. The one who successfully invades Jerusalem. That one who comes in with a confederate, who sets up shop, who desecrates everything there and stops everybody from going to the wall. And, and I personally believe that this individual could be the one who actually, within that three and a half years, builds something everybody's looking for. Because you guys hear people talking about the building of a temple, right? You know, in the Old Testament, there's a part at the very end. It says that it's going to be reestablished. But we have to take a look at some things in there. In the Bible, it says, No man knows the day nor the hour, not even the sun nor the angels in heaven, but God only knows when he's going to send his son. We can know the season, but we don't know when he's going to send him. And he kept saying he's, he's going to come at a time that we think not. If he comes at a time we're not thinking of, and he also told them, he said, in another another place in the Bible, he said, brothers, you know very well that day comes as a thief in the night. But there's no need that I communicate to you when that day is, when the Lord is coming back, when that day is, because you know very well when that day is, when that day is, that he'll come back as a thief in the night. And I looked at that and I said, there it is. When a thief comes at night, see, all I needed to hear was that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. If he comes like a thief in a night, forget about appointed times. Forget about that. And if he comes in the night, not in the day, but as a thief in the night, and the world is described as darkness, if he comes as the night, he's coming at a time of a high iniquitous state in the world. When he comes, when he comes, these people come with him. Now, here's the funny part. While they're set up doing this abomination and desolation thing for three and a half years, do you not know that right after this, the kingdom of the beast goes into darkness? Then the days of wrath come. Did you know that? Then all fulfillment happens. Those people in Jerusalem have to endure this indignation, not you. That was clearly communicated. Listen, I am not a theologian, but I'm con I have convictions in areas that I read, and I can. It's I didn't just dream it up. It's what's given to me, and I have to go with what the Lord gives me. But the hundred and forty-four thousand. Everybody wants to be the hundred and forty-four thousand. Did you not know that the hundred and forty-four thousand have to endure a great number of things? They're going to be scared to death. The Bible says. Do you know that? They have to be sealed because everything that is sealed is not to be touched when demons and Satan and all these things are loosed. But I also noticed that those who washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb, they did not have to be sealed. They're grafted into the branch. See, everybody's trying to be one of the original 12 tribes. Everybody wants to be that, forgetting that the ones grafted into the branch, they're beloved by the Most High. In fact... Let me read something to you. Because the Lord, he talked about the few, in future tense, he talked about those who were grafted into the branch, how that he would accept their offerings over his own peoples at any time. That they, when they gave, they didn't have the heritage everybody else had, but they gave from the heart. They gave, and what they did was genuine. You guys ever hear that verse when it says, well, a man robbed God? He was talking to the priest. He was talking to his own people whom he put in charge of keeping his ways in the earth, in his land. They were the ones robbing God. You can't rob God, but the priest can. Whoever receives on behalf of God, those are the ones that can rob him. You cannot. You're grafted into the branch. You don't share the same heritage. You can practice by way of an honor all things in the heritage of those who are the original 12, but you're grafted into the branch. That's why Jesus said, a Jew is not a Jew outwardly, but inwardly. And what that means is, no longer is somebody a Jew because they were born a Jew by the bloodline. They're considered a Jew or God's people inwardly. When you accept Christ, you become part, you become one of his people. See how that works. You're grafted into the branch. It's not reserved for you to go to the breaking that the blind are. God blinded his people so that the Gentiles could receive the gospel. After the Gentiles, after a specific number of Gentiles receive the gospel, the blinders of his own people are going to be lifted. 
And then, see, in the Bible it says that Jesus will come back. And they're going to wonder who put the holes in his hands. And he'll say, my friends did this to me. They won't even know who he is. But he will not reject them. He's going to open their eyes again. He shut them for a reason. That the power of the holy people could be distributed all throughout the earth. And everybody wants to be the 144,000. They want to be sealed. Did they ever investigate why they had to be sealed? They're going to be smack dab in the middle of some horrific things. I mean horrific things. My personal belief is because they keep of the 12 tribes, they keep male virgins in Israel. They do this every single generation. They keep them separate from all civilization. They educate them in the word of God only. They are in fact pure. And they do this on a continuous basis. They're there right now. Should, should the father tarry? Another generation will rise and you'll have more that will be there. So of the 12, the 144,000 are always there. See, here's the thing. Those who wash their robes white in the blood of the Lamb, they don't have to be sealed because they're sealed by their faith in the Holy Spirit. Jesus made that very clear. But those who have to endure a physical seal not to be touched, that seal is so they won't be touched by the evil that will be unleashed in the world. That's, what they, that's why they had to be sealed. Before the four angels who had power to destroy the earth, before they did anything, the 144,000 were to be sealed first. And then what did God do? He, the bottomless pit was opened. An angel with the key to the bottomless pit opened the pit. Who comes out? Abaddon, king of the demons, comes out. And then all the little demons pop out the pit. And they were commanded, they were commanded by the living God not to touch any green thing or anybody with the seal of God in their foreheads. But they were to torment man. They were to torment them. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. So something terrible will be unleashed. And if you knew about the wall in the Middle East, you would no longer think that that part of Revelation is fictional. Aju maju. Remember that term. Because if you ever see one, you'd probably pray that the Lord strike you with blindness right there and strike your memory. But they're coming. And nobody can stop them. It's a wall inside the earth, a separator. And they're coming through that wall. They've been digging through that wall for centuries. And that's not a joke. With all this UFO nonsense that people see on television, with all this nonsense and foolish disclosure, they're not disclosing the real things. No, they're not giants. No, they are not giants. They are nothing you want to see. And if anybody were to see one, I think a person would likely die on their feet. To see the silhouette of one, one of the ancient names they carry, because they, they, they carry these breastplates, it is said that one of the ancient names is Magog. Some of the original inhabitants of Magog. You gotta remember something. There's a lot that's unknown for a reason. Believe me, for a reason. Like what I just talked about. It's unknown for a reason. Anybody who's investigated that, there's only been a handful that survived it. There's only only machines, to my knowledge, only machines bought back the evidence. Nothing else did. The people did not. You don't want to be close to those things. Those are the same things that have power to torment mankind. You don't want to be close to that. And they will be free one day. They will be loosed. They will be let loose in the world, and there will not be one spot on the earth they will not cover. They're going to cover it. Every square foot of this earth they'll cover. Wherever man dwells, they will cover. And everybody who lives on this earth during that time is going to have to face them. And the Bible is very clear. They have power to torment man for five months, but they won't kill him. And their torment is that of a scorpion. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. That means you won't be able to die. And Revelation is very clear. And guys, also, if I bring up the Vatican, don't get angry. Because the Vatican took books and locked them away that people would benefit from having. They won't let people read them. They already know they won't. They already wrote letters of apology. They're trying to, to get the, you know, people in the Vatican have been trying to get these books out to people. Not the religion itself, but the stuff they hide. They hide a lot of things. And they do that because they protect power over the church. That's going to end. That will end. And each individual is going to find out they are responsible 
for their relationship with the Lord. Now, I believe this. When a person is raised and they're born, if that's all they know, then they better by way of the heart be honorable to what they know. Because if a person can be faithful to what they know, God is going to save whom he will save anyway. But you can't be a horrible Catholic and convert and be the best Christian. No, because there's no loyalty there. What do you think in the old times? God picked people who were loyal to whatever they were in. They were loyal to that thing they were in. He didn't pick people who were not loyal. Peter was a cussing person, but he was he was a fisherman who knew how to fish, and he was a loyal fisherman. In other words, he poured himself into it, because when you find a person who will pour themselves into whatever they're doing, when they have that type of integrity, upon conversion, they're going to have great integrity in what they're doing. When I used to fight, I fought with everything in me. I did everything I could do. Possibly, that's why he picked me for that. Because he knows I'll, I'll go to the point where I have no problem risking my life for the mission. I don't. And I have a new commander now. Listen, can I tell you guys something? Corporations, they're the ones who have all the secrets. That's what you, you know, like Johnson & Johnson, they have all the secrets. Like Verizon, they have all the secrets. Places like that have the secrets, which is why lobbying, you know, when people lobby, that stuff works, right? They have all the secrets. They're financiers. The government's not financing all these things. And the government works in ways you, you probably are not familiar with. Money is a construct. Money is a construct. It's based upon a very ancient ideology, an incantation, a control mechanism that's highly spiritual. Did you know that? You know, there are a lot of people who know levels of things. You could say I fell into the depths of something one time, and that was enough. But it's the corporations. They're the ones who have the power. Those are the hidden figures. That is the military-industrial complex. That is what older presidents warn about. The corporations... That is the shadow behind the shadow government. They run this world. They do. They tell the bankers what they're going to finance. Why? Because they have the pulse of you. You're moved by what you purchase. And what you purchase confirms of who moved you. Isn't that true? Whatever you buy, whatever you buy proves who got you, who convinced you the best. And you buy from the same people every time. The truth is, they don't need your money. See, there's a concept in a worldview. But I have to give you that small, tiny truth I know for a fact, which takes you beyond that worldview. It's going to seem like it's nuts at first, but it will unfold right in front of your face. That's what Kennedy warned about. That's exactly who he referred to. That's who has the secret proceedings. Corporations, when they lobby, those are the secret proceedings he discussed. Remember what the Lord said, in these days that you live in, men would call good evil and evil good. If you side with the world in any way, you're always going to be wrong. You'll still be a pawn. You're going to be played. If you stop siding with the world, for example, if you don't, if the world fights for somebody, then you back off. If the world wants somebody, back off. If the world hates someone, you back off. I'm telling you what I know. Because they're playing people like a fiddle. And everything that's happening now is exactly what they want to happen. The news media keeps drama going. It feeds you and then you react on social media. How in the world can Facebook be worth so much money? I mean, for goodness sake, all people are doing are typing nonsense on there. How can it be worth so much money? I'll tell you why. Facebook is a confirmation machine. It wasn't built by just one person. No, that's not how that works. It is the confirmation, instant confirmation. TikTok, all these little things are instant confirmation. And take note of something. When you get to these apps that steer away from conversations, they're not worth too much. Only the ones that can confirm what people feel about things, the ones that engage people in conversations. Going back to Daniel real quick. Take note how the abomination of desolation is set up after they come in. After that place is under siege. So where's the thousand year reign? Well, after this, after they set up the abomination of desolation, which by the way, Jesus said, this act where they set up the abomination of desolation, this area is going to be the worst place ever 
That's where, in fact, it says right here in verse 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, specifically thy people, thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. So we know this is a this is a nationwide thing, since there was a nation even to the same time. This is actually depicting the greatest issue happening right there in Israel. We're going to revisit this because I've got 78 supporting scriptures to that too. 78 scriptures that support that. That in Israel is where the indignation takes place. And that's very important to know because if the indignation takes place in verse 78, and while that's happening, it also discusses the other nations starting to push back at this guy, at this confederate that took over in Jerusalem, then that means other countries are still in operation. That's what it means. That means they also have an army because it even states that armies are going to push against this guy. See, after this time, the wrath pours out. After this time, the wrath pours out. When the wrath pours out, it is to fulfill the scriptures that says Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling. Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling after the three and a half years. After this three and a half years, everybody who set their hearts, their armies, and everything else against Jerusalem, they're going to pay for it. Then darkness, right? God's wrath will come down to this earth during that time. And the, the, the beast kingdom is going to be thrust into darkness. Satan will be bound a thousand years, and a thousand years of Christ's reign begins. But then after the thousand years is up, Satan is loosed from those chains. Now, curious enough, I'll ask you something. Is the thousand year reign only mentioned in Revelation? You know what the answer is? No, it is not. That thousand year reign is mentioned four times in the Old Testament. How consistent. No wonder the Lord said have two or three witnesses. And if he said that, that's a principle, which means for every major thing like that, the Lord says, he also will set up two or three witnesses. So that means other books have to corroborate what he's talking about. And we're talking about bound within the King James Version of the Bible. So yes, there's, there's evidence now during that thousand year reign. You're going to be changed. You're going to be like him. You're going to be forever. You're forever going to be with the Lord. But there will also be regular human beings here on this earth during that time. Because it states in Revelation that after that thousand year reign, when Satan is loosed, he'll go out and deceive the four quarters of the earth again. But it calls the earth at that time Gog Magog. And he will gather all those people again from the four quarters of the earth to the great day of God Almighty, that great battle of God Almighty. And that's when everything is over, over. That's exactly what Jesus explained. Now, here's the, here's the part you may not know about. Since, now this is just, you have to go and verify this for yourself, right? But I know for a fact, some of the books that I read, like the book of Barak, Esdras, I know those are authentic books. A lot of people say, well, they're not authoritative. The only authoritative book in the Bible to me are the words of Christ, which supersede all other things. It, he supersedes everybody else's word. And I'll tell you why. Because in the Old Testament, God said that if your children cut up, you take them outside of the city and stone them to death. But we don't do that. See how that does not work anymore? Because we live in an era of mercy. This is the era of the Messiah, the era of his gospel. He is the fulfillment of the law. Should we abide in him? We are known as keepers of the commandments through Christ only. No other way. Here tells a lot. This tells a lot. Most notably, though, the earth is segmented. The earth's history is segmented into 12 parts. I like uh, Book of Enoch says the same thing, too. We'll really have to go into a study of the Book of Enoch in the parables. That blows you away because everything is so consistent. I mean, consistent, consistent. Anyway, of these 12 segments in the book of Esdras, it tells us exactly where Esdras was during that time. He was already through 10 and a half. When Christ came, that was the 11th. Do you know that? When Jesus came, that was the 11th. When Jesus came. In fact, the Bible says that the end times started with the coming of the Messiah. Not the coming for the end of the world, but where he was, he would come as a lamb for slaughter. That began the last times. That's why Jesus said, and the apostle said, you, you've heard this is, these are the last times. He said, these are the last times. 
So if you want an idea where we are, other than your spiritual identification of these times, because you were born knowing that something in your lifetime was going to be pretty heavy. You couldn't trust when people told you it was going to be a beautiful future. You couldn't trust that. You can't even trust it now. Why do you think you look in the news? You're searching for something and you don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what I'm looking for, but when it comes, we're going to know. We're going to say, there it is. If one day equals a thousand and a thousand equals one day, then one over one is one. You know what that means? That's a negation. That's what that is, a negation. That means to God, there is no time. There is no time with God. That's what it means. A thousand years equals one day, and one day equals a thousand years. If you're looking at time spans, you're going in both directions, that is a negation. That means there is no time for the most high. That's what it means. So when people use that and they say, well, you know, the seventh day means 7,000 days and the first day was a thousand. I, I, I can't, I can't go with that. Where'd they get that from? Because I see a negation. I still see it like everybody else. If time governed anything of our father, then he's bound to forces he did not create. And if he didn't create those forces of which we operate, we live by, then something has gone terribly wrong, hasn't it? I've always seen God not even close to looking like a person. But most of what we read in the Bible is a representation of him. In other words, we've seen angels of the Lord. Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time. So what did they see? They saw a representation. Going back to the original Hebrew, you go back to the original Hebrew, read the story of Moses, you'll see that Moses saw an angel of the Lord. Guess what else he saw? He saw the trail of his glory. That was the backside. My goodness, just the trail of his glory he saw. He didn't see God. In other words, he saw a representation of the glory of God, and it almost killed everybody because it was pure. So when it comes to our Father, Jesus said, what? No man has seen God at any time. That's exactly what he said. Go do your lookup thing, you'll see it. Why does it say in the Bible, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? Because he gave them instruction first, saying that nobody has seen God at any time. He told them something, though. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Why did he say that? Because he is the Word of God made flesh. If you know the word of a person, that's how you know the person. You only know a person by their word. If a person does not speak to you, and if he never speaks to you, you don't know him. You have to engage in dialogue to know someone. That's why Jesus said, I speak what the Father says. So if you see me, you've seen the Father by way of what? His actions, his words. And that's how you've seen the Father. Then that's why he said, now you know, you know me. Now you know the Father. From here on out, you've seen the Father. In other words, God is his word. And his word is God. That's why in the Gospel of John it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. See how that works? Back to this time thing. You may be further along than you think. There's one major sign a real sign that the Bible gives over and over and over and over again for the last days. Do any of you know what that sign is? The most major sign other than the Messiah coming in the flesh as the Lamb. The major sign of the end times. It's iniquity. Iniquity marks the harvest. The harvest is when the wicked are separated from the righteous. Now remember, none of us are righteous because we somehow meet the qualifications. No, we are deemed the righteousness of Christ because he gave his life for us. It's not what we did. It's what God had his only begotten do. Remember that. In the Bible it says, more than a few times the wickedness is great. Get ye down there, the press overflows. Thrust ye in the sickle. Man's wickedness is great. That's when the harvest begins. That's when the angels separate the wheat and the tares. The angels do this. What do you see now in the world? What do you see? You see a force. It's in your spirit. So if I speak it, you should be able to identify it. You know there's a force in this world. 
a force that is dark and evil, a force that will turn your words back on you, a force that will leave you with nothing to say so that more evil that fights against your spirit, that's why you feel dead sometimes. You don't have to tell anybody, but I know this darkness is fighting against your spirit and it causes you to want to just stop. It causes you to lose your strength, to lose your energy. It causes you a numbness. I know in these days, if you're not careful, you can give in to that spirit that's been released. You can easily go back to doing the same sins you got away from so easily. In fact, I would go so far as to say that many of you, you know what your old sins taste like. And the Lord is removing your appetite, but you've got to fight until it's fully removed. Because you know how easy it is to slip back into it. You know what that spirit is. You felt nothing like it. How many times did you ask the Lord, what's wrong with me? How come I'm not energetic like I used to be? Remember how you opened the word of God? You would read with that energy. Now you open it up and it's, it's there. And confusion tries to come in. Do you know that Satan is the author of confusion? So now you know what's happening when you open the word of God and your direction is gone. Remember the hope you used to have. Who dashed your hopes? That's a spiritual dashing. That's a clear assault. And it takes the shield of faith always. Always. You start, you forget about your own faith. And you know you can easily be hit. And every time you're hit, you back away. There's a voice, almost an influence that's saying, I just, you know, just give up. This stuff isn't real. How many of you have gone through that? You're being directly fought during these days and it's stronger than at any other time. Remember the interest in the energy you had behind UFOs? What happened to that? What about those creatures and cretins? What happened to the energy behind that? The excitement is gone. Makes it a dead subject, doesn't it? It's dead. I mean, it is dead. Who killed it? Who killed that spirit that was in you to go and find things? Who killed it? God did you a wonderful favor. You just didn't identify it yet. All these things were allowed for a reason. You may not understand it now, but if I were to speak it, you would understand it. But if I'm true to the word I speak, that means many, if not most, if not just about all of you, relate to exactly what I'm saying. That's an internal confirmation of something very real that happened in your life. You're partakers of it. But did you know this? That was already foretold to happen right before something of magnitude took place. This time you're living in right now is both deceptive and it's going to pass so quick. People will not believe that this is that actual time. In the Bible, when the time of times actually came, do you know that no one expected it? That no one was looking for it? It came upon them unawares. It was business as usual in the earth. And if it's business as usual in the earth, nothing of great magnitude had taken place. Uh-oh. And you're listening to a person who has never put any confidence, who has never put any energy, zero energy, into leaving this earth. But I simply wanted to finish my race. With all these happenings that we've had throughout history, the same thing happens. Nothing happens when people are looking for it to happen. But in every single case, when people are not even thinking of something happening in a specific direction, and when everybody's doing something else, that's when the assault comes from that very direction. During 9-11, right, people were in shock so much and it really got people so much because no one suspected it would happen that way. That was the problem. Two planes flying into a building? You didn't see that coming. Some of God's children did. They saw it exactly, but they weren't believed. They were not. They didn't believe anything until it took place. They said that would never happen because their defenses are just too good. Plus... There are redundancies on aircraft that won't allow that to happen. Plus, you can't fly an aircraft that low altitude over a city because the automated systems will lock out the altitude drop and so on and so forth. And then guess what? They didn't listen. And two months later, it took place. Same thing is happening again. And it's not that people cannot have the understanding. It's just that their own mind is fighting anything from coming in that does not make sense. And you should know by now that the Lord does not do things that makes sense to us. Because compared to him, we're like frogs. 
And I'm sure that what we do in this world makes no sense to a frog or just doesn't compute at all. They don't know why that guy is carrying that shiny thing around with the little shiny thing at the end. They have no idea what that's for. They never saw a net before. They don't know what that creature is doing holding that thing in his hand. Why bubbles keep coming up in the water they're in. They don't know. Neither do we until it takes place. And when it takes place, all of a sudden, it is shock and awe. It'll always come in a direction and in a way that no one perceived. And here we are again. Things always take place by way of a method that has not entered into your mind. And even if you heard it, it won't stay in your mind. You'll have a hard time keeping it because it has no context anywhere around you. The Lord was not playing when he said that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He wasn't playing when he said that Jesus will come likewise. And now you see the formation within the people. A darkness is growing. You saw when you were small that people had darkness in them. And many of you bear witness that darkness has been with you from the day of your birth. You cannot deny that there's something awful in a lot of people. And it wounds and it hurts and it violates. And you cannot deny it. You know firsthand. It exists within the earth, and it can hide so well. You know that too, and it continues to operate, and people defend it unknowingly. You know the frustration that's coming. Now they're doing it openly, like a mockery in front of everybody. Remember something, the Lord will never abandon you. Your life is not like those of the world. You're under a covenant, a new covenant. Don't ever think you're going to be left to the wind like those in movies or of the world or something like that. What feeds you and what will strengthen you now is not a story of UFO. Sometimes you feel low in energy because you need spiritual food. And that's what Satan is trying to keep everybody away from. Because once you get that spiritual food, you're going to notice your demeanor changes. Your energy levels change. Your health is going to change. Everything will change. And that's a fact. Satan knows what he's doing to keep you away from your fulfillment. Well, there are people sent here to combat him in those areas, especially away from your thinking. It's up to you to yield to the Messiah, not me, but to the Messiah, and he'll do the rest.